Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for coming to the colloquium today. We are very happy to uh, host Ed Barnes from uh, uh, Virginia Tech, and um, he will speak his his expert on um, quantum information science and condensed matter theory. He has many publications on the topic. Um, He's professor in Virginia Tech, as I said earlier, and he will speak to us. Um, he will speak to us on noise-resistant quantum control from geometric space curves. Ed, thanks, George. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a it's a pleasure to speak at the, in the colloquium series. Um, so yeah, so this talk is about quantum computing, quantum information more generally, and how certain concepts from mathematics can be beneficial to to various tasks in that in that space. And so feel, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I'm happy, it's perfectly fine if I don't get to everything in the talk, but there's no issues with that. Uh, I just wanted to mention right off the bat that I'm happy to, I'm very lucky to be part of a, a very large and vibrant group working on quantum information theory at Virginia Tech. Um, so these are people mostly in physics, but also some people in chemistry. We have a very nice collaboration. And so we have a large number of students and postdocs working on various topics, as well as a couple of other faculty members aside from myself. And of course, uh, several of the group members here are going to be responsible for most of the work I'll tell you about. So quantum information technologies can, roughly speaking, be divided into four main pillars. So there's quantum computing, which is probably the best known one. Um, but there are also these ideas like quantum com communications and networks, uh, quantum sensing and quantum simulation. So these are areas in which some aspects of quantum mechanics can somehow um, enable technologies which are not otherwise possible or which uh, perform much better than existing classical technologies. So I'll give a couple of uh, examples. Kind of the first step in uh, toward any of these technologies is to replace classical bits of information with some quantum two-level system. So roughly speaking, we can think about the memory stored in a classical computer in terms of either a capacitor, which is either charged or not charged, or it could be a magnet or, or something else, but something that has two possible states, two configurations to represent either a zero or a one uh, bit of information. So in a quantum system for computing or, or whatever else, we are replacing this classical bit with some quantum system. And sometimes the simplest example to think about is a spin, where, which is a, some quantum system that has two possible configurations, uh, much like the classical bit. But here the Important difference is that in quantum mechanics, we're allowed to have superpositions. So instead of just having zero or one, we can have a linear combination of these two possible configurations of the system. And this by itself already enables lots of interesting um, ways to process information, which are, are not really accessible using fairly classical bits of information. So this idea of superposition, along with some other basic uh, aspects of quantum mechanics, including entanglement and measurement induced collapse of quantum states, have really already revolutionized the way that we think about information and information processing. Um, and now there's a, a big effort to figure out ways in which we can kind of leverage uh, this new understanding of how information flows to, to do interesting things. So why pursue quantum information science? What's, what do you gain by replacing classical bits with quantum bits? Um, there are, there are a number of ways to think about this. So one, maybe the most fundamental one is to just notice that information is really a physical thing. So the foundation is of computer science, you know, things like Turing machines, universality, these ultimately rest on the laws of physics. And so thinking about quantum mechanics and what it has to say about information is kind of natural in that sense because quantum mechanics really is uh, what governs uh, physics on very small scales. And that also kind of leads into the second point I have on the slide here, which is this notion of Moore's law. You know, as you keep making devices, things like transistors, smaller and smaller, eventually the fact that you're reaching scales where quantum mechanics uh, is, the, is the theory that describes what's happening becomes really important. And ultimately you have a quantum system. Your transistor is in the quantum regime. And so you have to take that into account uh, no matter what. Now on the more practical side of things, there's this, um, there are several problems or classes of problems, which are really intractable on even the world's best supercomputers today. So the factorization of large numbers is well, one of the best known examples of this. So just the, taking a very large prime integer and trying to find the, the prime factors of that is not a prime integer to start with, but finding the 
prime factors of a very large integer is a very challenging task. And the difficulty of that problem is basically what underlies current cryptography systems. You know, the systems that are protecting our credit card information online all rest on the inability of, of classical algorithms to solve a problem like this. On the more science side of things, there's um, the observation that if you're trying to simulate a quantum system, this is very awkward to do with a classical machine. This is a point that was first made by Richard Feynman back in the early 1980s, where he noticed that if you try to simulate a classical system on a quantum, on a, on a, if you try to simulate a quantum system on a classical computer, you immediately run into this challenge of just not having enough um, memory to store all the numbers you need to, to characterize a many body wave function. On the other hand, Feynman noted that if you had a quantum computer, then it would sort of automatically take uh, in this into account because quantum systems are, you know, they already know how to store the information in a quantum way. And so using a quantum computer to simulate a quantum system seems like a very natural idea and a natural way to get around this, this bottleneck of classical computers. And then finally, I wanted to mention that um, there's also lots of important applications in relation to communication security. So the principles of quantum mechanics you can show allow, at least in principle, for the possibility of hack-proof communication. But there's no way to send information from one point to another in a network um, without being detected. Uh, there's no way to intercept information in a network without being detected. So there are lots of interesting ways in which quantum mechanics can enable novel technologies. So for any of these technologies, though, the fundamental ingredient, as I mentioned, is a quantum bit or a qubit. And it was more or less uh, recognized in the 90s uh, that a qubit has to satisfy many criteria in order for it to be useful for quantum information applications. It it's a two-level system, first of all, but it has to be one that we can control very well. So you have to be able to prepare whatever superposition state you want on the qubit, and you need to be able to rotate that state to any other state. Um, you need a way to measure it quickly and accurately. It has to be reasonably well isolated from its environment because if your qubit interacts with other stuff nearby in some uncontrolled way, then the information stored on the qubit is going to be lost very quickly. And this is a process known as decoherence, which I'll talk a bit about quite a bit in, the, in this talk. And then also to do something interesting, you, you need to be able to couple qubits to other qubits and entangle them. Um, that's pretty much required for almost all uh, interesting protocols based on quantum mechanics. So there are a number of, in the last uh, 20, 25 years, there are a number of systems that have been explored as potential qubits, um, things like individual atoms, which are trapped by um, some sort of electric or, or other type of field in a very localized region. You can use levels on the atom uh, as, a, uh, as a qubit. You can also trap individual electrons in really small regions on the surface or, uh, or the interface between two materials. And so if you trap an electron in a region of size a few tens or hundreds of nanometers, you can then effectively just worry about the spin on the electrons, you know, treat it like a little bar magnet, but a quantum mechanical bar magnet. And that behaves like a qubit. And then there are various other rather uh, different approaches that also work very well. You can use photons, individual particles of light as qubits, um, other kinds of spin systems in solid materials, and also superconducting circuits. So these are like uh, typical electrical circuits, but made out of materials such that when you cool them down, the electrons in there behave very differently and you end up with a quantum mechanical system. So all of these systems have proven to be very um, promising for various applications within quantum information science. So here's a quick overview of the state of art of the art for quantum computing. Um, so here you can ask how many qubits have people been able to um, fabricate and couple together and start to do interesting algorithms on. So um, I'd say the, the largest systems are the ones developed by various companies. So a lot of the major tech companies now in the US have their own quantum computing groups, including IBM and Google and, and uh, Amazon and several others, Microsoft also. And so they tend to have the, you know, the, the largest system so far because they have a lot of the engineering expertise. They have very large teams working on very focused projects. So IBM has processors with, with 50 or more qubits now. Google has even larger ones with up to 70 or so qubits. Um, these are based on superconducting qubit systems. 
but there are also um, large systems based on trapped ions. Right? There's a startup company called IMQ that has the largest such processor, which has, I think their latest model has well over 50 qubits now. So that's roughly where people are, but we're at the level where we can start to run very simple algorithms on these systems and test them out and see what we need to do to make even larger ones. And to do something really interesting, if you want to factorize a large integer and break the RSA crypto system, steal somebody's credit card information, you need something like a million qubits, something on that order. So you can see we're very far from that level. But if you want to simulate an interesting, um, complicated system like you know, a strongly uh, correlated molecule, for example, you might not need so many qubits to do that. There are some, some estimates suggest that you can solve interesting problems using only 100 qubits, at least if they work very well. So I think we're not too far away from starting to see practical applications uh, come to fruition. And there are some signs of this have appeared in, in the popular news in the last couple of years. So these are two uh, articles in Nature, I think, uh, talking about some recent experiments by Google and also by a very a large um, quantum computing team in China, where they built large systems consisting of up to 50 to 70 qubits. And they <clears throat> claimed at least to have done a, or to have solved a problem which you cannot solve on, a, on the world's best supercomputer in any reasonable amount of time. I'm not going to get into which problems they solve because they tend to have to find very specialized and rather useless problems um, that, to make them realizable on the on the systems on the system sizes that we have currently. Um, but these are at least first demonstrations that we're getting close to a regime where using quantum mechanics can actually give you an advantage over classical computing. So a major um, roadblock in making these systems even better and, and bringing them to the level that they need to be in order to solve problems of practical interest is this uh, problem of noise and decoherence that I briefly mentioned earlier. So you build a system of many qubits, couple them together, but it's inevitably the case that your qubits will interact with something else, you know, something in their environment. If it's a bunch of qubits on some material, then there's a bunch of other stuff in the material that you don't want to be there, but you can't really get rid of. And that stuff interacts with your qubits and causes them to basically leak the information out into the, to the environment. So this process is called decoherence. And if it happens too quickly, then you don't have time to do a computation of interest. So to give kind of a quick idea of what this uh, does to your qubit, there's a, the simplest model we can talk about, which is called dephasing. You know, first of all, we can visualize a qubit as a, as a little vector that lies on the surface of the sphere. The point lies on the surface of the sphere called the block sphere. And so different superpositions correspond to different orientations of this vector, different superpositions of the zero and the one state. And now suppose in your environment, there's some magnetic field that fluctuates in time. So if you turn on a magnetic field, your, your qubit starts to precess around the direction of the field. But now if the field is fluctuating in some uncontrolled way, then every time you run the experiment, the amount by which the qubit precesses is different because the rate of precession is controlled by the strength of this magnetic field. So if that strength changes a little bit, then the precession rate changes a little bit. And so here you see these six arrows correspond to six different runs of the experiment where in each run the field was slightly different. But what happens in practice is to get a strong enough signal, the experimentalists have to average over all these um, runs of the experiment and take the final result as the average of all these. And so if every time they run the experiment, the field's a little bit different, the precession rate's a little bit different. When you add up all of these results, you end up getting something that's getting closer and closer to zero as time goes on. So this is a this is actually real experimental data for a certain a certain type of qubit based on spins. But the, the point here is you can see that initially you have a strong signal. This is the spin vector. And then as time goes on, you see precession, but also you see that the, the length of this vector is decaying down to zero, indicating that you're losing the quantum information uh, over time. And in this case, it really is as a consequence of fluctuating magnetic fields in their system. And you can see the time scale here. This is after 25 nanoseconds or so, the signal is completely gone. So all the information is lost. So either you do all your computation within 25 nanoseconds, which is incredibly challenging, um, or you find some way to extend the lifetime of this qubit. And so that's basically what this talk is about. How can you find ways to slow down this decoherence process? So the 
the basic idea that I'm going to talk about is one that's also uh, used in classical life quite often. Uh, the idea is, can we find some way to drive the qubit in such a way that it's sort of naturally becoming decoupled from its environment? And so you can have in mind kind of this classical system of noise canceling headphones, where you know this is a device that takes in information from the environment. It takes in some signal of, of the noise you're trying to cancel. And the headphones create their own signal in such a way that it exactly cancels that external noise source. And so the qubit, the baby in this picture, in the end sees uh, basically nothing because the noise has perfectly been canceled by the, by the controls inside the, this headphone set. And so we're looking for some sort of a quantum mechanical analog to this. Can we drive the system in such a way, given a little bit of knowledge about, about the decoherent sources in the system, can we then drive the system in such a way that we just counteract those sources? And so the evolution, the, the way in which the qubit evolves is that it's as if there is no environment. So this idea has actually been around for a long time. It was first uh, thought about in the 1940s and 50s. And the first example of this, so this was done in the context of nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, which is a, uh, basically a field of study that underlies lots of um, applications that have been around for a long time. For example, magnetic resonance imaging is basically based on this kind of technique. So here the idea is that if you have a qubit that's um, decohering like we discussed a few slides ago, if at, the, at this point in the evolution, if you then apply a very strong pulse to the qubit, in such a way that it just flips over completely 180 degrees and lies in the opposite direction, then in the remaining time, um, these different runs of the experiment, the final um, spin vectors will eventually just kind of coalesce and come back to all point along the same direction at some later time. And the reason this happens is because if you think about what's happening here, you have some of these spins which are processing more slowly and some are processing more quickly. The ones that process quickly move very fast away from the starting point, which is here. And then if you flip them all over, now the ones that are furthest from the final value are the ones that are also processing fastest. And so the faster ones will catch up to the slower ones. And so they all end up aligning at the final time. So the basic idea behind this Hans spin echo, as it's called, is, is very simple. You just flip everything instantaneously halfway through the evolution, and then the slow guys will catch up with them the fast guys will catch up with the slow guys and they all coalesce at the end. So this is the simplest example of what's called dynamical decoupling. You somehow drive your quantum system in such a way that you counteract the effect of the environment. And this works so long as the noise is very slow, meaning that every time you run the experiment, the fluctuation in the magnetic field is effectively constant so that you have a constant rate of precession. And fortunately that turns out to usually be the case in most of the qubit platforms that people are pursuing. The noise tends to be quite slow. So this idea has been generalized over the last six or seven decades. And the most straightforward generalization is to instead of applying a single instantaneous pulse halfway through the evolution, people can apply a periodic train of instantaneous pulses. So here the, these tick marks just indicate at which times you're applying the pulse uh, over the evolution of of the qubit. And you can also try different sequences where you apply the instantaneous pulse at different times. And different sequences will give you different performance. They will extend the lifetime of the qubit by different amounts. And which one does best really depends on the details of the system. But here are just some experimental examples from quantum computing, different kinds of qubit platforms that people have uh, investigated and applied dynamical decoupling to. And you can see like, for example, here, you can see that when you use dynamical decoupling, which is which are these blue dots compared to not using it, you get a significant improvement in how long um, the information on the qubit lasts. And one thing I wanted to just mention here, this is one particular example of the type of spin qubit living in silicon. And here you can see that when you use this dynamical decoupling technique, you, get, you can extend the coherence time up to over half a, a minute. And so you can compare this to the 25 nanoseconds I mentioned earlier, you can see that these kinds of techniques are, are, are incredibly important for making quantum computing and related technologies work in practice. So in this case, you could prepare a, a spin state, some superposition of, of your qubit and you know, look at your watch and, and wait and see how long that, that uh, superposition lasts for. Uh, 
But these dynamical decoupling techniques I just described, they really only allow you to preserve some quantum state for longer times, but they don't cancel the noise while you're doing operations on the qubit. And to do anything interesting, you need to also rotate the qubit and do different operations, different logical gates, for example, if you're talking about quantum computing. And this means that you need to find a way to cancel the noise while you're doing operations, not just while the qubit is sitting there idly. Um, and so this then has to do with, well, how do we design quantum gates in the first place? So a quantum gate is just a, a um, conceptually, it's just a generalization of logic gates from classical computation. You know, you can think about things like AND gates or OR gates, uh, where you take in a bit of information and then you apply some operation like one of these gates and that changes the bit into something else. And all of classical computation is based on combining gates in different sequences to perform different algorithms. If you want to design an algorithm that adds two numbers in bit form together, then there's some sequence of gates that does it. And so that idea extends naturally to the quantum regime. And then we talk about quantum gates, which are operations on quantum bits. Now, designing a quantum gate amounts to designing the evolution of the quantum system, the quantum bit. And the evolution is governed by the Schrodinger equation. And so here, this is the equation, the Schrodinger equation expressed for the evolution operator U. And so U is a two by two for a qubit, it's a two by two unitary matrix that tells us how the initial state of the qubit evolves to some later state at some later time. And so given a Hamiltonian that um, determines how that evolution works, you then have to solve this differential equation to obtain the evolution operator. And then the value of this unitary matrix at the final time is, is called the gate. So this tells us how the qubit evolves over this time span. And here I, I picked a generic form for, for a qubit Hamiltonian. So here I assumed I have some time dependent term here, omega of t in the off diagonals, and I have a constant here, delta in the diagonals. So this type of Hamiltonian applies to most types of qubits. And the physical nature of these different terms depends on which kind of qubit you're talking about. But you can think about omega of t as being some applied false. pulse. It could be, for example, an electric field, like a, a voltage that's changing in time or a magnetic field you're applying to a system. It depends on which qubit you're talking about. But the mathematical form of the Hamiltonians is the same. And then delta here is some sort of an energy splitting qubit. And sometimes I'll call delta the detuning um, because I can also think about this Hamiltonian in the case where I'm applying an oscillating external field to my system. And then delta tells me the difference between the frequency of the applied field and the natural frequency of the qubit. So, in, so to design a quantum gate, I need to choose a driving field omega of t such that the final evolution operator is some desired two by two unitary matrix that rotates my qubit in some desired way. And all of the quantum information technologies of interest require the ability to implement various types of gates with very high precision. To do anything interesting, you have to have a rotation that's almost exactly what the ideal rotation is. And so this means we need to find a way to cancel noise during gate operations. How can we design pulses which both implement the target operation that we want, but also remove effects from noise at the same time? So a simple model of what noise does is shown here. So I can take the same Hamiltonian, but now I allow for the possibility that there is some environmental effect which, which adds a random stochastic shift to my detuning parameter, I'll call this epsilon. So that's one type of noise in the system that arises in most types of qubit platforms. And another type of noise I can have can create an error in, my, in the driving field itself. So there could be some random stochastic shift in this driving field. And so both of these errors together are going to mess up my uh, evolution operator such that instead of getting the target operation I want, I get the target operation plus corrections to that, which are proportional to these error terms. So the question then becomes, can I find a smart choice of this driving field omega of t, which will give me the target evolution I want, and at the same time, cancel at least the first order noise terms. So notice here, I wrote order epsilon squared plus delta omega squared and so on. Here, I've assumed that I've already canceled the first order terms in epsilon and delta omega. 
And so that's kind of the goal of this talk is can I find driving fields omega t that remove these, at least the first order terms, maybe the second order terms as well. And so if I can do that, then I can get the target operation I want to very high accuracy. So I first started thinking about this problem almost 10 years ago now, when I was uh, approached by some experimentalists who had who were working on different kinds of qubit systems and they ran into this noise problem very quickly. And they were asking if there was some scheme I could cook up that would uh, you know, do exactly this, cancel these noise errors, at least a leading order. And what I and some of my colleagues at the time uh, thought to do is to try choosing this pulse to be piecewise constant. So this is an example of one of the pulses that we considered. So here, this is a, a plot of the pulse omega t as a function of time. And you can see that over different time spans, the pulse is held constant, but you know, every so often we change the magnitude of the pulse. And this particular sequence of square pulses was chosen so that the leading order noise terms would be canceled. And so you can go back to the previous slide and try to, and I guess the, the, the point I want to make here is the reason that we focused on square pulses is because you can solve this differential equation analytically in that case. If I come back here, in the case where I don't have the noise terms, I have this uh, second order differential equation, the Schrodinger equation, and I can easily solve that if omega is a constant. And so if I start with, if I assume the pulse is a square pulse sequence like this, then I can get analytical solutions. And then the task becomes, how can I find constraints on, on the pulse amplitudes and durations, you know, each piece, such that the leading order noise terms are canceled. And this is something we did in a series of papers uh, starting almost 10 years ago. So square pulses are mathematically easy to use. Um, but then when we went and worked with experimentalists to implement these in, in the lab, we ran into the problem that square pulses are far too idealized for the real system. That if you try to apply a square pulse in a real experimental setup, the actual pulse that gets produced is pretty far from a square because it's impossible to make a, a pulse that turns on infinitely quickly and turns off infinitely quickly. So we end up with something very distorted from this. And it's a bit hard to know what the actual pulse shape is because there's no way to really get into the system and see what, what pulse shape is arriving at the qubit. Um, so the main message from those interactions with the experimental teams was that can we find something better than square pulses? Can we find smooth pulses that do essentially the same thing? Um, and so that's was the motivation for the work I'm going to tell you about. So to understand the solution to this problem, how can we find smooth pulses that cancel noise? I'm going to start with the simplest case here where we have the driving field on the off diagonal of the Hamiltonian. And now let's suppose that the constant delta that I had in originally is just zero for simplicity. And so all I have on the diagonal term is epsilon, which is this stochastic noise parameter. It's a constant, but it's an unknown constant. And the goal is to make the evolution operator insensitive to epsilon, at least the first order. So I can expand the evolution operator in a perturbation series under the assumption that epsilon is small. So I have some series like this, where these u sub n's are some two by two matrices, order by order. And you can show without too much a uh, math that each of these terms in this expansion is controlled by some complex function that I call g sub n. So this, if you look at the first order, for example, it's a two by two matrix. It has off diagonal entries. Those off diagonal entries are basically just given by g sub one. And so requiring the first order term to vanish is tantamount to requiring this complex coefficient g sub one to vanish at the final time, uh, which I'll call capital T. So then this is a constraint I have, I have to solve in order for the noise to be canceled. And you can, if you work it out, you find that these G sub n satisfy this recursive um, relation. So the first one is just equal to one. And then this, the G sub one is equal to this integral involving the driving field. So you can see the task is I need this, all these integrals to vanish at the final time, or at least the first few of these integrals. And, but these integrals depend on the driving field in a rather complicated way. And figuring out how you should choose omega of t such that the integral vanishes at the final time is a bit tricky. 
But we noticed more recently in this work here that if you think about the problem geometrically, then it's actually very easy to understand how you should choose the driving field to satisfy these noise cancellation constraints. So the idea we had is to take the first of these coefficients, setting n equals to one. This is a complex function of time. And so we can just draw it in the complex plane where the vertical axis is the imaginary part of G1, the horizontal axis is the real part. And initially at time t equals zero, you start at the origin because if I set t to zero here, the integral gives me zero. But then as time progresses, I'm tracing out some path in this complex plane. So that's kind of a trivial statement just because G is a, G1 is a complex function. But then what's interesting is that if I stop at some point and compute the curvature of the curve at that point, it's exactly given by the driving field omega. So I can define the curvature of a plane curve like this by just drawing a circle that has the same bend as the curve itself at this point. And then the curvature is given by the inverse radius of that circle. And another interesting property that we found is that the length, the arc length of the curve is exactly given by the pulse time. So that if I stop at this point here, I know that the amount of time by which I've evolved is exactly equal to the length, the arc length of the curve uh, going all the way back to the origin. So these two observations allowed me to solve this problem in full generality. Because if I think about what I'm plotting, I'm plotting this first order coefficient g sub one. And my goal is to make that coefficient vanish at the final time. And so in terms of this geometric picture here, that means I need to make this curve come back to the origin at the final time. And if it does that, I'm guaranteed that the first order noise term will cancel. But then the observation that the pulse is just given by the curvature means that I could first just draw the curve in a closed way. And then I could read off the pulse that implements that robust evolution from the curvature. So this is a completely general solution to this problem. So this was a uh, work done by, by my former graduate student, Junkai Zheng, who's now um, an engineer at uh, one of these quantum startup companies called Q Control, which specializes in quantum control. And here, the, here are some examples of this basic idea. If you draw a closed curve like this, then you can read off the corresponding pulse by computing its curvature which is just a measure of how much the curve is bending at each point. And the duration of the pulse is exactly equal to the length of this curve. So if I draw a smaller curve, I'm gonna have a faster pulse. And the third interesting fact is that the target rotation on the qubit that's implemented by the pulse is related to the opening angle at the origin. So here, if I draw a closed curve with a cusp with a given opening angle, Depending on how I choose that opening angle, I can I will end up with the desired rotation of the qubit. So I can both set which target operation I want to implement, and at the same time, I can guarantee that the noise is canceled to first order by making the curve closed. So this also shows me that if I want to perform different rotations on my qubit, then I need to draw closed curves with different opening angles at the origin. So these are four different examples of closed curves. They all have different opening angles and they each implement a different operation on the qubit. So I could easily generate whatever operation I want um, just by changing that angle. And then for the, each of these four examples, you can see the corresponding four pulses obtained from the curvatures. And one way that we use to generate nice smooth closed curve like this is to refer back to various families of lemnus gates that were um, that were popular among famous mathematicians back in the 19th century. For example, Girono had his favorite uh, family of lemnus gates here. So lemnus gate just means figure eight. And of course, if you take half of the figure eight, that gives you a closed curve like this. Um, and Bernoulli had his own favorite lemnus gates and there are many other families of lemnus gates that have been studied uh, quite extensively. So this is a general solution. So this means that it should also include all these families of instantaneous pulse sequences that people have been developing since the 1950s. And, and this turns out to be the case. 
So if I am interested in spin echo, for example, how can I understand this geometrically? So in the case of spin echo, this corresponds to a curve which is flattened onto a line. So I still need a closed curve to cancel noise. So here I start at the origin and I trace out this, this straight line. And because the line is straight, initially there is no pulse. I'm just waiting while the qubit processes. But then at this point here, I turn around infinitely fast and then start to retrace the same line back to the origin. And at the point where I turn around infinitely fast, there the curvature is infinite. And that corresponds to an instantaneous delta function like pulse that's applied halfway through the evolution of the qubit. So this is exactly the spin echo pulse that we talked about earlier. And so long as I wait the right amount of time in the second half of the evolution so that I arrive exactly at the origin again, then I'm guaranteed that the noise will be canceled. So spin echo looks like a simple delta function pulse. Uh, I'm sorry, spin echo looks like this flattened curve. If I look at any of the other famous um, instantaneous pulse sequences that have been developed over the last 70 years, another one is called CPMG, which corresponds to a periodic train of instantaneous pulses. All of these just correspond to going up and down a straight line some number of times. So here, if I start in the middle, I go up initially, I turn around fast, retrace the line down, come back down to here, turn around infinitely fast, and so on. Every time I turn around infinitely fast, I pick up a delta function in my pulse. And so long as I stop in the middle at the final time, I'm guaranteed that the noise will be canceled. So I could easily reproduce all of the known instantaneous pulse sequences this way, but I can also generate infinitely many more sequences just by drawing you know, lines that overlap like this some number of times. But as we saw in the previous slide, the most general solution to this problem is to draw a curve on a plane. And if I allow my curve to lie in the plane and not just along a line, then I end up with a pulse which is nice and smooth and much more experimentally feasible to implement. So the general statement is that any pulse that cancels the noise to first order corresponds to the closed plane curve. So this is the entire solution space of this dynamical decoupling problem. Uh, an interesting thing that we thought about recently is what if we consider the case of linear driving, meaning that we have a pulse that starts at some negative value and just increases linearly over time. So this kind of driving has been studied since the beginning of quantum mechanics. Uh, there were some early papers by Landau and Zener where they studied what happens when you drive a quantum system through an avoided crossing in the energy spectrum. And they considered exactly this kind of driving to study that problem. And they computed probabilities to have transitions between the two levels. If you translate this kind of pulse into a curve, it turns out to correspond to the Euler spiral curve, which is shown here. So you spiral out from one point and then wrap around and come back and spiral in at a second point. So this is the, so if you compute the curvature of this curve, it's a linearly increasing function of time or arc length. So this has interesting connections to um, some works that have been, uh, that came out in the last decade or so studying places where Euler spirals are, arise. For example, if you take an orange and, and peel it in a nice uniform way and in, in the limit where the, the peels are infinitely thin, this exactly corresponds to an Euler spiral. And then you can lay out that peel on a, on a tabletop and it exactly forms to uh, this kind of shape. Now you can see that this linear ramping here does not give you a closed curve. It starts here and ends there, so it's not closed. So this kind of driving does not cancel noise. But as a, our student at Virginia Tech showed, Fei Zhuang, if you take two pieces of Euler spiral and, and glue them together in a nice smooth way like here, this, these are three examples of um, two Euler spirals that have been glued together. Then in this case, the pulse ends up looking like this. You start off with a linear increasing pulse and then it, you bring it back down linearly to form a triangle pulse. So each of these three closed curves shown on the left corresponds to one of these three pulses on the right and the colors are, are matched. So because these curves are closed, now these pulses do implement qubit operations while canceling noise to first order. And what 
Faye went on to show is that you can actually prove using this geometrical uh, framework that it's impossible to cancel noise using a monotonically increasing pulse. And Faye did this by relating it back to uh, a well-known theorem in the differential geometry of curves known as the Tate-Nessor theorem, nesting theorem. And so by relating this problem to the nesting theorem, you can show that you have to use a non-monotonically changing pulse in order to cancel noise. So, so far I've discussed canceling the first order noise terms, but you can also uh, do better than that. You can cancel the second order as well and even beyond. And there's lots of interesting um, geometry that comes out here too. So if we want to cancel the second order noise term as well, then we have to go to that second order expansion of the evolution operator that I showed you a few, a few slides ago and try to find a pulse which will make that coefficient of that second order term vanish. And what we found is that that coefficient is proportional to the area enclosed by the curve. And so if we want a pulse that cancels both first order and second order noise while implementing some target gate operation, then we need to draw a closed curve that has zero net area. So an example of that is this blue figure eight here. So here I can see that it's nice and symmetric, and but because I trace the curve counterclockwise in the upper half uh, plane, and then clockwise in the lower half plane, there's a relative sign between the orientations of these two lobes. And so the areas exactly cancel each other. And so in general, if I now just keep the full lemnus gate, um, like, we, like in the examples we showed previously, now we naturally get these figure eight curves, which will cancel second order nodes. So I have three other examples here with these three other colored curves. And again, by computing the curvature of these curves, we can extract the pulses that implement this robust evolution. Now you can notice that if I use a nice symmetric figure eight, then the opening angle at the origin is always pi. And that turns out to correspond to doing what's called an identity operation. You're not actually rotating the qubit, you're just canceling the noise. To do a non-trivial rotation, you need to use a less symmetric curve, but you can still draw less symmetric curves that have the same properties of being closed and enclosing zero net area. So for example, if I look at the orange curve here, it's been designed so that the upper half, um, the upper lobe is, it has exactly the same area as the lower lobe, but again, there's a relative sign between the two orientations. And so the net area is zero. So in this way, I can create curves that have non-zero opening angles, non-trivial opening angles at the origin, which then gives me pulses that implement different qubit rotations. So this approach of drawing curves on a plane and extracting the pulse from the curvature suggests that we should use some sort of um, a computer interface to do this. Uh, we did take a first stab at this a couple of years ago where we created this program called DD Draw, where you can draw a curve with a mouse and then in real time it shows you the pulse that you're producing by computing the curvature and it also shows you both the second order noise error which you're trying to make zero at the end and also the gate operation you're performing. So you can start drawing this thing and you can see which pulse, what pulse is being produced. And you can also try to draw it in such a way that you bring the second order error down to zero at the end and also bring the gate operation to some desired value. But as you can see from this example, you, know, you have to have a very steady hand to get a nice smooth pulse that your experimental colleagues will be happy with. Um, so there's, so th this leaves a lot of, uh, a lot to be desired. You, know, it, you can, it's possible to create software that's much less sensitive to your, your hand shaking, but that's something we haven't gotten into. We're not very sophisticated in, in, in designing software like this, but hopefully somebody at some point will create a better version of this. Now, I wanna come back to a point I mentioned earlier, but didn't say too much about, which is that the curve that we're drawing has a length, which is equal to the pulse time. So this is also a very powerful result because, you know, because of decoherence, we don't only want um, a nice smooth pulse that cancels noise. We want that pulse to be as fast as possible because there could be, you know, we're focusing on one type of noise, but there could be other types of noise and errors in the system that are still acting on the qubit. And they will eventually cause the qubit to decohere. So in general, it's, it's always the case in quantum information technologies that we're trying to make operations as quick as possible so that we can 
have many operations um, happen in the in the in the lifetime of the qubits. So here, the the fact that the the pulse time is equal to the length of the curve just means that if we want a faster pulse, we should draw shorter curves. And so we can just draw a curve, and if we want a faster pulse, we can just shrink the overall curve. That will maintain both the error cancellation and also the rotation that we're doing on the qubit if we maintain the opening angle at the origin as we do the shrinking. But ultimately, if we just let the curve shrink arbitrarily small, and that's going to lead to a delta function pulse because the smaller the curve becomes, the, the larger the curvature, and so the larger the pulse. And so if you keep shrinking the curve, eventually the curvature and the pulse amplitude will become too large, you know, beyond what can be done in the experiments. And so to make this problem more practically relevant and interesting at the same time, we impose an upper bound on the pulse amplitude, which is typically uh, what happens in experiments. There's some limit to how strong they can make the pulse. And geometrically, this imposes a limit on the curvature. So now the task is, can we find a closed curve that has a certain opening angle at the origin and it's as short as possible without violating this constraint on the curvature? So this is a problem that we can easily set up as a variational calculus problem, where the task is to minimize the length of the curve, which is expressed here in terms of Cartesian coordinates x and y. And we can include additional Lagrange multipliers and slack variables to impose these constraints on the curvature and also on the, um, on the area of the curve if we, if we want to. And it turns out that this variational calculus problem is very easy to solve. And the solution is that the curve has to be comprised of straight lines and circular arcs of radius equal to one. So basically the circular arcs are saturating the constraint on the curvature. And so then the task is, can you find closed curves made of these components? And we thought a bit and realized that there are only three closed curves that you can make using only three segments. And these consist, so one example is two straight lines and a circular arc or you can use one straight line and two circular arcs, or you can use three circular arcs. So these are three ways to create a closed curve using only circular arcs and straight lines. So these are the shortest curves you can find. And then you can ask, okay, which of the three is the best for a given target operation? And it turns out that the blue one is always the optimal solution. So regardless of which rotation you're doing on the qubit, this curve made of three circular arcs is always the shortest. And since circular uh, arcs translate to uh, have constant curvature, this means that they correspond to a square pulse segment like this. So initially for this part of the uh, closed curve, you have this value of the driving field and it stays constant until you reach this point where you then switch over to this circular arc here, which has positive curvature. And so now the pulse comes up and stays fixed at this positive value. And then finally we have a third piece of circular arc, which has negative curvature. And so the pulse comes back down to this negative value. So this is the globally time optimal solution to this problem of noise canceling pulses. You could do the same thing at second order as well. Now you add in a slack variable in the variational calculus problem, um, where now you impose the condition that the area of the curve vanishes at the final time. And again, we find that the optimal curve, the shortest curve is made up of circular arcs, but now you need five pieces to get a closed curve that has zero area. And so since each piece again corresponds to a circular arc, this means that we have a square pulse sequence that has five segments now. And you can work out exactly what each of these um, widths of the pulse should be um, for a desired uh, rotation on the qubit. So here we saw that the optimal solutions are square pulses, but I started this uh, discussion by saying that we don't like square pulses, at least our experimental friends don't like them. But what we can do is we can find some systematic way to then smoothen the, the optimal solutions, given some constraint on how quickly the, the pulse can be turned on and off. And so we found that there are two ways you can think, at least there are two ways that we thought about how to, to do this smoothening. One way is to just take the pulse itself and just perform some sort of a smooth approximation to it. Uh, that's what the, the green curve is here for this particular example. Another way you could do it is to go to the curve itself and somehow 
deform the curve a bit so that you end up with a smooth curvature. And that's what the red curve corresponds to here. And we find that in general, um, adjusting the curve is much better than adjusting the pulse. You know, trying to smoothen out the curve is better because that allows you to maintain this uh, zero area cancellation constraint much more easily. Whereas if you work with the, if you start with the pulse and try to smoothen that, it's harder to maintain these noise cancellation constraints. So this second approach seems to be best. So, so far I've talked about the simplest case where we have only epsilon on the diagonal term, but we can generalize this to uh, the case where we have a non-zero detuning parameter delta. So delta is just a known constant that we switch on. And so we can ask, can we do the same thing in this setting, in this more general Hamiltonian for a qubit? So one important difference that arises in this case is that even in the absence of noise, we can no longer solve the Schrodinger equation analytically. So when this detuning parameter is zero, it's very hard to solve this equation analytically to find u. And this was a point that was appreciated early on in quantum mechanics. This is the simplest example of a quantum dynamics problem, but, for, but given an arbitrary omega of t, there's no known analytical solution for the evolution operator. And this can be related back to the Riccati equation, which has been studied for a long time in the mathematics community. But this doesn't stop us from setting up a geometrical framework to describe pulses uh, or to obtain pulses that cancel the leading order noise effects in this setting. And one way we can understand this is to think about the Schrodinger equation. You know, on the one hand, if we're given a Hamiltonian, it's very hard to find the corresponding evolution operator analytically. There are a handful of known examples, but for the most part, it's very difficult. On the other hand, if we're given an evolution operator and, some, and asked, what is the Hamiltonian that produces that evolution operator? That problem is very easy because I can just invert this equation to get an expression for the Hamiltonian in terms of the evolution operator. And so given you, I can just plug into this formula and read off what the Hamiltonian is. So I can largely get around the problem that the Schrodinger equation is not solvable in this case by just thinking about this kind of inverse design approach where I'm designing the evolution and then the task is to read off the Hamiltonian that yields that evolution. So that's the philosophy I'm going to take. And so I can still do a perturbation series expansion in my evolution operator in powers of this noise term epsilon. And even though I don't know what the evolution operator is in the absence of noise, that's this u zero, I can still do this expansion and I can still try to see if there's some systematic way in which I can um, design pulses that cancel noise. And here you can see that the leading order noise term is now given by this integral expression involving this unknown um, noise-free evolution operator. And I can notice that this integral here is a Hermitian matrix since u zero is, is unitary and this is a Hermitian matrix. So I can parameterize it like this. This is a, some generic traceless Hermitian matrix, uh, two by two. And it depends on three real numbers, Rx, what I called Rx, Ry, and Rz. And I can think about these three functions of time as being three components of a space curve. So this is generalizing the idea we saw previously for the simpler Hamiltonian, where we talked about the evolution in terms of plane curves. So here, when I have a non-zero detuning, I can think about a space curve instead. And it's still the case that what I want to happen is at the final time, I need this integral to vanish, which means that this space curve has to come back to the origin and form a closed curve. So that's what I've sketched here. So this suggests that uh, if I draw a closed space curve in three dimensions, then I can then try to find pulses from this that implement evolution while canceling noise to first order. And interestingly enough, if you take the space curve and compute the curvature uh, and the torsion, they exactly correspond to the parameters in the Hamiltonian. So a curve in three dimensions is characterized by two functions in general. There's the curvature uh, like we saw for plane curves, but now there's also a second function called the torsion which describes the amount by which the curve is twisting out of a plane at every point. 
And so it's interesting to see that when you compute these two basic quantities of a 3D space curve, they correspond exactly to these terms in the Hamiltonian. And so then the strategy is very much like we talked about for plane curves. Now, if I draw any closed curve in three dimensions, uh, I can figure out what is the corresponding pulse that gives me that robust evolution by computing the curvature and the torsion. And so we did, created many examples uh, like this using this idea. So here's an example of a closed curve in three dimensions. And I can compute the curvature and torsion to obtain the driving fields in the Hamiltonian that give me that robust evolution. And then I can, I can see how much does the actual evolution deviate from the ideal one. And not surprisingly, it, it agrees quite well. Now, it also turns out that if we look at the second order noise cancellation in this generalized formalism, then now the condition is that if I look at the projections of the curve in three dimensions along three orthogonal directions, then now what I need to happen is for the area inside each of these projections to cancel. And so here's an example of a three dimensional space curve where if I project it along all three orthogonal directions, the corresponding projected curves have zero enclosed area. And so when that happens, I fully cancel the second order noise term as well. So I think I'm nearing the end of the talk. So one thing I wanted to mention before I wrap it up is to, is to point out that um, one important difference that happens when we go to the more general cases is that now I have to impose additional constraints on the curve. So here I noted that this parameter delta, the torsion has to be, if I consider the case of a system where delta is constant, then when I draw the space curve, I need the, the torsion to be constant. Otherwise the curve I'm drawing is not related to the physical system I'm trying to describe. And so what the, our student Fei Zhuang did is she came up with a general recipe for constructing closed curves of constant torsion so that we can then systematically obtain driving fields that will cancel noise in a system described by a Hamiltonian like this when delta is constant. So I won't get into the recipe, but you know, roughly what happens is you first design a, a curve with certain properties in the plane. You project this onto a three-dimensional curve on the sphere, and then you can use this to then convert it into the 3D space curve that describes the evolution of the qubit. So there's a systematic recipe, I'm not gonna get into it, um, but it's an interesting problem that's been studied for quite a bit in the mathematics community. And we borrow lots of results from there to, to come up with this approach. So I think I will kind of wrap it up here. Um, so a couple of things I want to mention is that we've found that you can generalize this to multi-level and multi-qubit systems. And it works much the same way if you want to drive a system of several qubits in such a way that noise gets canceled, then it's still the case that you're drawing a closed curve, but now the curve lives in higher dimensions. And the dimensionality of that space depends on the structure of the Hamiltonian describing the system and also the type of noise you have. But uh, I'm not gonna get into the details here. And now it becomes an interesting problem of how you construct a curve that satisfies various properties in higher dimension um, simultaneously. But we have found examples um, that work quite well. And then a last point I wanted to make is that we can also generalize this to canceling multiple types of noise at the same time. And so the examples I showed you were focused on canceling these detuning errors epsilon here. But at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that you could also have errors in the driving field itself. And so if both of these types of noise are present, can you still come up with a geometrical system, a systematic way based on geometry to find pulses that cancel both types of noise simultaneously? And the, the answer is yes. And the task basically boils down to connecting to this concept of holonomy and holonomic gates. It's been quite around for quite a while in the quantum computing community. And what we showed is that by combining this space curve constructions with holonomic gates, then you can systematically cancel both kinds of noise at the same time. Okay, so I think with that, I'll just um, put up the summary slide and I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you very much, Ed, for the beautiful talk. And uh, uh, are there any questions? Yeah, I will ask you a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, so at the beginning, you gave kind of a, a high level sort of overview of what a qubit is and, and how quantum computing works. If you presented a precise mathematical model, you know, like definitions of everything, how involved would that be? Uh, I think if you, so there are a few different models of quantum computing. So I think it depends on which model you, you decide to focus on. Here, I was sort of implicitly thinking about what's called the circuit model, where you basically just start with an array of qubits and a collection of gates. There's a certain set of gates that you, you allow yourself to use. And then the task is simply to find sequences of gates um, that perform some desired algorithm. You know, if, the, if the goal, for example, is to factorize some large integer, then there's some sequence of gates applied to a set of qubits that will do that. And so if you like, that's one definition of quantum computing. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Perhaps I would like to ask, is uh, the epsilon noise there, is the epsilon a fixed noise or is something varying with the time? So in this talk, I've always assumed that epsilon is fixed. So I, I mentioned at the beginning when I talked about Hans Beneko that you can have slow noise where you run the experiment multiple times. Every time you run the experiment, epsilon is a constant, but from one run to the next, it can change in some stochastic way. And in the experiments, they end up having to average over many runs of the experiment. And so in that average, you're averaging over different values with epsilon. But in the during the evolution of a single pulse, epsilon is, a, is just a constant. So this is called quasi-static noise. So noise that varies slow, very slowly compared to the time scale of the pulse. Now it does matter in, in real um, qubit systems that the noise does have some time dependence. And so epsilon does actually fluctuate a little bit during the pulse. And this is something that we've um, looked at more recently where you can extend the geometric formalism I described to that case as well. Um, there you end up having to design not just one closed curve but actually a family of closed curves which are all related to each other in some way. And so by making all these curves close at the same time you can cancel time dependent noise in, in much the same way that I described here. I see. Yeah, it just gets, it gets quite a bit more complicated, but it, it is doable. Is it somehow related to some type of Gaussian uh, type of functions in uh, for modeling your noise or? Yeah, so the, we focused mostly on Gaussian type noise, which means that um, there's a noise power spectrum that describes the, no the noise. So there's some function usually called S of omega, which tells you how strong the noise is at each frequency. And, and so given a noise power spectrum, you can design a series of curves. And if they close, then you can cancel the bulk of the noise caused by some power spectrum. Thank you. Hmm. So I have a question. So these um, um, pulses is designed to eliminate noise after the operation, but not during, right? Yeah, so noise does accumulate during the operation, but it's it ends up canceling out uh, by the end of the evolution. That's right. Oh, so so the um, so the design of the noise cancellation is actually folded into the operating pulse itself or? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Ah. So the pulse is both doing the gate but also arranging for this noise cancellation. Okay, I see. Yeah, it's, it's 
it's a bit amazing that it works at all. I think yeah. I've been working on it for quite a while. I still, I'm still kind of surprised that it's possible. So, so that that means before before applying these pulses, um, it's it's we need to actually know the noise environment sort of associated with. Yeah. So, so what I assumed is I assumed that I knew along which axis I knew where the in the Hamiltonian the noise appeared. Oh, okay. I didn't I didn't know how strong the noise was. Um, I assumed it was not too strong so that I could do a perturbation series expansion. Right. If the noise is too strong, then there's really nothing you can do. Okay, so that doesn't require um, a um, sort of like a previous knowledge of the noise before you can decide. Mm -hmm. okay. That's right, yeah. But that knowledge is usually available because um, in, the ex when, in the experimental setups, once they find a well-defined qubit, they spend a lot of time analyzing what are the main decoherence mechanisms, where along what axis is the noise acting, how strong is it, and that kind of thing. And so I, I take that information. Actually, the Hamiltonians I showed, I was basically using models of the noise that were obtained from experiments. Okay, thank you. Sure. Are there other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, um, thank you very much, Ed, for giving us this beautiful talk and so many beautiful geometric ideas inside. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And if nothing else, I hope you enjoyed the pictures. Uh, one nice thing about this topic is that there are lots of fun pictures you can draw. So. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Nice meeting you too.